Singapore, a city and island nation, has the largest port in Southeast Asia and one of the busiest in the world. Singapore attracts millions of tourists each year. It is known as Instant Asia because visitors could have a taste of Asian cultures that immigrants have brought from different parts of the continent. Early this month, Richard Branson criticized Singapore's drug policy and death penalty for drug trafficking in his blog post. Why does Singapore take a very tough stance against drugs? To understand the reason, we have to go back to the colonial history of Singapore 200 years ago, when Stanford Raffles and the British landed on this island. Raffles started his career in the British East India Company, EIC, in London. He was assigned to Southeast Asia in 1805. Several years later, he served as Governor General of Java. From as early as the 17th century, European trading companies competed for trade in the East. In 1818, the Dutch returned to the East Indies after the war in Europe and reimposed restrictions on British commerce in the region. In order to prevent the monopoly and protect India trade with China, Ruffles and his team started looking for a new trading port for the EIC, and they made their way to Singapore in 1819. It is known as the beginning of modern Singapore. In order to attract traders and ships, Ruffles made Singapore a free port, which brought not only traders and merchants, but also permanent settlers. In just two years, Almost 3,000 vessels with 200,000 tons of cargo visited the port. And in four years, the population has grown 10 times to more than 10,000. Free port status meant that all goods could come into Singapore without paying taxes or duties. It also meant the colonial government couldn't collect enough funds for public works. These funds were crucial for building infrastructures to accommodate the fast-expanding population. However, the reports showed that its revenue grew steadily throughout the 19th century. What made the revenue growth possible? Where did they collect the funds? According to the annual report of street settlements in 1871, the sources of revenue were licensed stamp duties, postage, revenue from land and other miscellaneous duties and other revenues. Licenses are exercise duties on opium, spirits, pawnbroker, and etc. Among all these sources, opium generated the most revenue. In fact, opium was a major source of revenue for the British administration. The opium revenue accounted for about half of the Singapore's total revenue for almost every year during the 19th century, and it remained a key pillar of the physical system right into the 20th century. The start of opium trading as a commodity was apparent as early as the mid-16th century, when Indian merchants began exporting small amounts of northern Indian opium to China. By the early 17th century, Portuguese, then Dutch, and finally British traders entered the market. The supply of opium to China and Southeast Asia came largely from India. Under the British rule, India became the world's largest opium producer by the beginning of the 19th century. Up until the 16th century, in the Middle East, India, and China, opium was primarily a luxury item, both as medicine and for recreational use, and mainly restricted to elites. It, it became popular as a recreational drug in the 19th century, where opium smoking became an accepted social practice, according to an article in the Scientific American from 1898. They smoke it as Americans do tobacco. Nearly every well-regulated Chinese home has its opium smoking outfit where the guest is invited to smoke. Many of the merchants have such as a retreat in the rear of their shops, into which a customer may be asked to smoke as an American merchant is invited to take a cigar. 
the main consumers of opium were Chinese coolies who worked at plantations cultivating pepper and gambia in the inland Singapore. Chinese coolies who were engaged mostly in unskilled hard labor formed the early backbone of Singapore's labor force. They were driven by poverty in China to seek a better life in Singapore, but instead served as indentured laborers. Coolies were employed in almost every sector of work, including construction, agriculture, shipping, mining, and rickshaw pulling. The coolies were often exploited and abused by the coolie brokers. They had to endure grim living conditions and owned very little. Many of the jobs involved hard labor. Among the coolie workers, opium smoking offered a solace and to relieve their fatigue and to escape from their harsh reality. Also used as a panacea for common health problems. By the end of 1843, one in three adult Chinese settlers were addicted to opium, who were mostly coolies. The colonial government collected the opium revenue via revenue farms. The revenue farm practice was very common in Southeast Asia at the time. They were a relatively easy way of collecting revenue, especially from foreign populations. The farmers were among the most influential and respectable of Singapore's Chinese. They had nothing to do with agriculture. The revenue farm was a scheme that government licenses were auctioned off to private individuals or syndicates to give them the monopoly to distribute process opium. The sums at stake were enormous. The profits from winning the prize were also enormous. So people referred to the opium farm auction as a battle of the kings. Influential and wealthy Chinese businessmen made a fortune from the opium monopoly. It's also common that opium farmers collaborated with the Gambia and pepper planters. Whoever controlled plantation also controlled the laborers who were the main consumer of the opium. Whoever controlled opium had access to capital that could be plowed back into the plantations for supplementary profit. This collaboration was also favorable for the colonial government because it was useful to secure opium revenue. The syndicate was organized through revenue farm scheme. From the mid-1840s, two important and lucrative revenue farms, Opium and Spirits, were owned by this syndicate till 1880s. They not only used opium as a tool for labor control, but also profited heavily from the sale of the drug to addicted Chinese coolies. About 20% of India's annual production of opium found its way into Singapore. Out of this, a portion were transshipped to China, but most were consumed locally or redistributed to other parts of Southeast Asia through the domestic trade. The Singapore opium farmer simply purchased his supplies on the open market in Singapore. He processed the opium into Chengdu, a smokable opium, and distributed to local opium shops for retail consumption. The ash of residue after opium was smoked for the first time was also recovered by shopkeepers and sold at a cheaper rate. Singapore's revenue heavily relied on opium revenue. The main consumers of opium were Chinese coolies. Much of what they gained were channeled back into the consumption of opium. So it's fair to say that Opium smoking coolies literally paid for Singapore's free trade and its development. From the revenue breakdown, it seems that something missing from the list, income tax. Although income tax was well established in Britain in 1870s, it was not implemented in the British colonies in Southeast Asia. Harry Ord suggested income tax in 1869 when he served as the first colonial governor of streets settlements.
but faced with strong opposition from the merchant in Singapore. Later, due to the declining revenue from opium, A.P. Adams, a member of the merchant community, proposed again an income tax, faced the same rejection from his peers. The opposition proposed increased taxation on opium and alcohol, and if the revenue was still insufficient, a tax on tobacco, cigars, and cigarettes. As a result, the colonial government abandoned its proposal to just like the resistance of introducing income tax, anti-opium movement also faced oppositions from opium farmers and the newspapers in the 1890s. Singapore banned opium in 1946, but that didn't stop people from continuing to use drugs illegally. In 1952, there were about 2,000 opium smoking salons in Singapore. According to the newspaper, not enough officers in customs to wipe them out. In 1975, the death penalty was enacted for drug traffickers for heroin and morphine. In 1989, in an attempt to bring a complete stop to drug and opium abuse in Singapore, the government passed a bill to extend the death penalty to cocaine, cannabis, and opium traffickers. Including manufacturers, importers, and exporters. This is not the end of the story. Otherwise, Branson would not write a post about it. No matter what approach people take, the main purpose is the same: people around the world want to live peacefully and happily. When we know what people in Singapore have been through. It's not so surprised that Singapore takes a very tough stance against drugs.